Hey everybody, so today we are going to be talking with Mike Bennett, one of the main architects behind the financial industry business ontology, also known as FIBO. This is one of the really well-known ontologies out there, and it's an upper ontology, which means you don't really use the entire thing as an ontology. It actually helps industry leaders and those that are working with financial data kind of have a similar understanding, not always the same, on some of these concepts in the financial space. And it's also very helpful if you are creating an ontology that has any kind of financial information because it's an upper ontology, which means you can kind of mix and match your vocabulary and ontology data with how FIBO is defining it as well. So it's a really handy tool to be aware of. In this video, we are going to be talking about how you can use FIBO in your real life, what it's really useful for, and kind of how to use these kinds of ontologies in your own world. All right, so if that sounds interesting to you, keep on watching. Hi there, yeah, so I'm Mike Bennett. Um, I'm I'm an itinerant ontologist, is what I put in my profiles. <laughs> I, uh, I, I, I originated the financial industry business oh. ontology, or FIBO. Mm -hmm. So I worked in the finance space in standards and so on for a long time, even before that. Nobody thought it made any sense at all. Like, you know, they wanted to have one kind of ontology. They wanted the answer to be that there's one kind of ontology <laughs> for everything. And anything else wasn't the message they wanted to hear, you know. So Yeah, and, and it's funny, too. I was at um, uh, a presentation a few weeks ago where somebody was talking about FIBO, and I said, is anyone actually using it? I made it. We all kind of laughed. We're like, does anyone actually use FIBO as an ontology, like as a full ontology? And the answer is no, right? No, it's, it's defining things. It's it's helping yeah. you not have to reinvent the wheel as to like the measurements and the this and the that and the other thing. Um, yeah. But I think well, that that's where people get confused. And I had a, I do also have a video on the difference between an upper ontology and a lightweight ontology. Good, good. And it doesn't do very well. And I think the reason is because no one knows there's a there is an actual difference and no one really exactly. cares <laughs> well that's the, that's the whole i mean this is really the whole thrust of what i want to do with this broadcast because people have to care but people the business have to care you know sure. I, teach, I teach and stay in its lane and people who are very good at hourly stuff might not be very good at thinking in terms of concepts and understanding what the different taxonomic relationships mm -hmm. are and how you tease out all those levels of abstraction some of them won't even use a top level ontology and all the time, the, you see the way they look at it is, oh, well, that's difficult. Or, you know, you try and teach them how to use contextually relative versus independent things with a simple top-level partitioning mm -hmm. for that. And, you know, it took three or four years just to get someone to understand it. And during that time, they think, well, if I struggle to understand it, it must be really hard, so we shouldn't be doing it. <laughs> of course, the business understands that stuff really well. But the IT people are always going, well, what does the data look like? And do I have to reify this and that? And yeah, like, yeah. Well, no, and I'm it's also, I think, not even just, like, the difference between business and tech because there's 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 a group in between there which is usually like knowledge engineers and the ontologists yeah. right they're kind of in both camps well, and <laughs> yeah one of the first conversations i always have with any team that i start to work with that are in that that middle camp it's not all not all teams have this issue but a lot of them and that is they are so wrapped up in is this a thing? Is this a real thing? And is this thing related to this right. other thing? That conversation happens in every single organization that is doing anything oh, with ontologies. Yes. It's fascinating that, because very often yeah. they, they they miss the really critical part, which is, and why does it matter to your end use case and user? Because oftentimes yeah. it's just like this theoretical, semantic, um, you know, mental gymnastics, which are perfectly fine. But at the end of the day, that doesn't matter. It matters if you're answering what your end user needs, right? Yes. And yes. I think that's a big disconnect. Yeah, it is. And I think, again, I've got a, a whole lot of methodology on that that we've been developing because, you know, and again, it's something I want to cover in this video because the real meaning of most things in the world doesn't come from data. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, people in the data discipline, both in semantics and outside it, tend to think as though data is everything. Like if you mm -hmm. explain to them the notion of a, a legal construct or some legal capacity or capability or something like that that's firmly grounded in the real world notions of law or accounting or mm -hmm. other kinds of reality they go oh that's terribly abstract <laughs> what we want is this data which is concrete and i'm like no i mean you know i can pick up my phone and shake it like this it doesn't get any lighter because actually no data is abstract it's the real things that are concrete including real legal and accounting things you know they come from human yeah. social constructs yeah. which are absolutely real Yep. And in finance and in most business, that's more important a lot of the time than, you know, physics or chemistry or anything, which are also obviously parts of reality. So because they gloss over that, mm -hmm. they miss the relationship between how do I how do I define what 
firstly, what does this word mean? Well, words are very contextual. So, okay, mm -hmm. what concept does this word map to in this context? Now we isolate a concept. Okay, so this concept, which you can call whatever word you like, um, how is it grounded? Oh, it's grounded in law or, you know, regulation or, okay. you know, logistics or something. It's something real. Okay, now what data do we have that might correspond to that? Mm -hmm. Or what data can we create to correspond to that? And because people aren't thinking about that, we had a classic case, in, in a classic example in FIBO. Um, at one point, they decided that, and this is after it was out of my hands, I hasten to add, uh, the people um, doing the subject matter expert reviews and adding stuff said, well, uh, the test for a bank should be that it has FDIC insurance. Now, ignoring for the time being that that limits you to the United States of America mm -hmm. and other particular set of states, mm -hmm. um, they decided that was a suitable property to reason over to say when something was a bank. In other words, a data surrogate for something real, but they weren't mm -hmm. framing it in those terms that I, I define, okay, here's a real world construct and then here's the data surrogate. For that. Because they weren't framing it in those terms, they mm -hmm. weren't reviewing it and inspecting it. And then one day they discovered, oh, guess what? The DTCC, the Dep Depository Trust and Clearing Corporation down there in, in uh, Wall Street or Water Street, I think. Anyway, uh, that is a clearinghouse, but it has FDIC insurance. They've chosen the wrong data surrogate because yeah. they were making a conscious... Uh, I'm an old-fashioned engineer. Before I came anywhere near semantics, before I came anywhere near software, you know, in engineering, you start with the business definition of the world exactly. in computationally independent terms. And then not only do you derive your design from that, but you can mm -hmm. validate your design against that because you have a separate formally controlled representation yeah. of reality, which is a spot that ontology fits in very nicely, of course, because that's what ontology is. Yeah. So um, because they weren't separating those concerns, mm -hmm. they weren't yeah. inspecting, do we have the right, right data surrogate or not? They had to wait till they made a mistake. Now, yeah. the, the right data surrogate for a bank is a banking license, provided you're in a developed economy and you only want to reason over things that are already banks. In the same way that for securities, the test for what makes something a security was written in the 1940s and it's mm -hmm. called the Howey test. Mm -hmm. You won't find the Howey test in any data. There wasn't any data in the 1940s. Nobody was worrying about data. <laughs> this is what it really means to be a security. Great. Well, you've got a good data surrogate for security. It has a security identifier. When it's yeah. issued, somebody issues it, they register it with the registration authority, it gets identified. Well, and that's all depending on the use of you, right? Until, because if you're yeah. doing machine learning for, let's say, classification, uh -huh. that might not be in in unstructured full text to identify what a bank exactly. is. In that case, you might care. Exactly. It's it's a, a physical location, perhaps that yep. you know has checking and like there's other characteristics exactly. that you would define. That's that. really important because there's there's two things to tease out on that because um, uh, let's see now um, trying to think of two things at once here is never very good. Uh, so. One of them is that uh, if you're, once you separate those out, you say, okay, for this set of data, and I don't like the word use case, that brings it out to individual applications. But if you're looking at a concept model for a whole organization or an industry, you've got the range of use cases of stuff you're doing with data of that industry. Then you can say, well, for all of these use cases, it's fine that we have the identifier or the license, the banking license or whatever. But if you're in a new space like crypto, or if you're in an emerging market economy with like, you know, microfinance initiatives bubbling up from like you know, rural lending syndicates and that you want to know is this a bank or not or is this a security or not based on the raw information that's out there now you have to find data surrogates for yeah that's a physical place where this thing happens okay well when this thing happens who makes what commitment what are they incurring by risk okay we can start to find data about that reason over that data and return a classification result that says aha you're a security you're a bank and so on um but the other thing and this is the point you made is when you're looking at the meaning of words that humans are uttering, you're not in the data space at all yet anyway. <laughs> so for natural language processing or, you know, question answering or even, again, for creating business glossaries, what the humans yeah. in the business mean by something, you're only looking at what that really means. So you're only looking at the legal and other constructs that make up what does it mean to have legal personhood or what does it mean to be yeah. the legal capacity to borrow short and lend yeah. long or the other way around. Um, all of that stuff. So you're right. In those spaces, those application spaces, you're not even you don't care about data surrogates because you don't care about data. Well, I mean, I think that's what the ontology in that space does, though, right? Like it still creates the concept of what that thing is, right? So if my that's concept right. is ID one two three four, but the characteristics, the attributes on that are, I am a pet, and I meow, and I have a tail, and I'm furry. I don't have to tell you it's a cat, and mm. Depending on where you're from, you might call it kitty, you might call it gato. It doesn't yep. matter. That's a human label, um, you know, depending on where you're from, what language you speak, all of that. Yeah. Yeah. But the characteristics of what that thing is 
especially when it's physical, yeah. is a little bit easier to, to, to define. Um, and that's the kind of stuff that you need to understand that it's it's that that mental model of what is this thing right I, n- I never put a label on it and that's what that's the beauty of an ontology right it doesn't have to have a label or the labels can be switched out right depending exactly. on the context but the characteristics yeah. of that thing because it's physical yeah. is is kind of the same yeah and that's absolutely critical because if you can't swap out the label then you're not doing ontology yet a lot of people you know i've come across this or where you you think you can focus on the word you, know, you see people using our same as for two mm-hmm. words and then suddenly you realize that the whole artifact the classes represent words well nobody wants that you want something that represents concept mm-hmm. with as many terms as you like. And, mm-hmm. you know, there are terminology standards. Scars, of course, lets you put a layer on top of that, but it's a bit thin on context. You know, the yeah. contextual use of words, there's a lot more to context than just some speech community, like in those terminology standards. It's the whole who, what, when, why of, you know, when somebody is using this word in this context, you know, it could be as simple as, you know, in this contract or in this document, this mm-hmm. word means blah, blah, blah. Mm-hmm. But you're right, the meaning is all about that uh, the kind of duct typing thing, if you like, yeah. of what are the characteristics that tell me what kind of thing this is and yeah you're right you can create data for each of those characteristics once you know what they are mm-hmm. or you cannot you know but ontologically the definition of the thing doesn't care whether you create a data for it or not i mean that's why right. we have the open world yeah because it's problem. modeling the real world right so you don't necessarily have to have the data back yet but again like i'm always looking at the practicalities of of an ontology you probably shouldn't have a node unless you have data to back it right or or you have something in again uh, your use case that's Hold on, but yeah, that, or you have something in your use case where you then need to find the data to support what you're looking for, right? Exactly. So, yes. Yeah, yeah. I, I I'm not a fan of, and again, for upper ontologies, it does make sense to create nodes that may or may not have data to back it quite yet, because you're trying to model a very specific um, domain space in in you know what you'd exactly. be trying to, yeah. to facilitate. But yeah. when you then take it down the next level. I mean, that's what 50 allows you to do, right? Is say, okay, I only care about security. So I'm just going to take that piece or I'm going to take these nodes yeah. and these, these attributes and I'm going to learn from those and then supplement with whatever I need for, for my individual yeah. use cases for those. Yeah. That's, what, I'm, but, that's but, what the upper ontologies help with. Yes, but but again, you, you got the use of the ontology for some application. It might be integrating. It might be as the schema for the knowledge graph across your whole organization. Um, but you might have you might be wanting to use the ontology just to capture the real business meanings of stuff mm-hmm. without having any solution in mind, you know, for reporting, mm-hmm. for, mm-hmm. you know, just sharing concepts at a management yeah. level, knowing what we all mean by something. So then the question is when you then want to stand up a knowledge graph, which of those real world things do you want to create some data instances for? Mm-hmm. Now it could be, for example, you've determined that, you know, here's the real world meaning of, you know, legal person has these capacities and so on. There's no data for the capacities, but here's the data surrogate. They're, mm-hmm. they're either human or they've got, and they're over 18, or they're an organization and they're registered in some way. So we, we know they've got legal personhood. Great. We've got all those data surrogates for that reality. Now, if we want to, we can reason over those data surrogates and populate data instances of those real world legal things. So you get the example with the cat, where it's nice and simple. Everything's grounded in physical stuff you can see and hear. Yeah. Think of the organization as an entity, like the organization's own brain is its knowledge graph, or right now is its data as a whole, which is not very well integrated. But if you move it to a knowledge graph, you've got an organizational brain. The groundings of the meanings of that are all there, linked between the data and the reality. So that's why these data surrogates are really important. It's mm-hmm. like, how do I know? And, it's, and really, you know, ontology is one small part of, you know, got all the ologies, you know, the epistemology and the... Yeah. We've talked about all of those without using their funny names so far, and let's carry on doing that. But... Um, the relationship between meaning and truth, the truth values of this data, depends on us understanding the relationship between the data we're creating and the reality it represents. Mm-hmm. So you no longer depend on humans to provide the meaning of these words now. You're mm-hmm. saying, okay, we created an organization brain. In my brain, meaning is grounded in what I see, what I hear, what I feel, and so on. It's all grounded in the qualia of, a, of a little things inside one of these. Mm-hmm. You know, so, but in the organization, it's grounded in contracts, legislation, logistics. So there's some physics there. Mm-hmm. Um, but mostly all these social constructs like money and so on. So mm-hmm. the whole accounting, you know, profit and loss, you know, loan to um, um, rate, value ratio, all those things are grounded in reality, just mm-hmm. as the cat is. So those are all the characteristics of things the organization yeah. cares about. And so that the, any data about that has relationships to the real thing. It's like, you know, if, if, I, if I define the weight of something, you know, I, I define that, you know, there is something and it has weight because or it has mass. And because it's on a planet, it also has mm-hmm. weight. And so we can even use mass as a surrogate for weight if we wanted. Uh, I can know that's a fact about the thing. But then in this data source, I might have it in kilograms. In this mm-hmm. one, I might have it in pounds and ounces. Over here, I have it in troy ounces because it's gold I'm looking at or something. 
So these are what we call the value spaces yeah. that link the data to the reality. Yeah. And so to have an oversight of that, to have that top-down you know, separation of concerns, you have to care about the real meanings of things yeah. without yeah. thinking about data, then care about the data. Am I creating an organization's brain or am I doing an yeah. individual application for figuring so, something? Here's the thing, though. I, I disagree. Oh. And, and, but but it's, it's probably nuanced, right? So I, I agree with many things that you're saying. But one big pitfall that I've learned my own in my own um, falling on face moments is most of the time at an organization, again, not talking about upper ontologies and things, but when you're at an organization and you're trying to solve for a real problem, you already have a, a lot of the data. And yes. so often, and this is why I only like say this is a cautionary tale to what you're saying, is you have to look at the data and try to derive what is that, where is that data coming from? What is the real, and when I say where, I'm not talking about which database, I'm saying, is it coming from a real person? Is it coming from a real product? Exactly. What is the tangible exactly. thing yeah. that is happening? What's its, what's its relationship to the truth? Exactly. How is that actually coming about? Because I think yep. sometimes, especially in the ontology space, people can start with the let's model the world and how we think about it before we look at the data. And then you have so much more work ahead of you because that data is a model kind of on its own because it's 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 being generated from something. Yeah. And so you have to start to look at the data first and try to marry that with the mental model of the real world and how it's it's functioning. Yeah. And it can it can impact how that data is then being derived because maybe right. it's wrong, maybe it's coming from maybe there were assumptions yeah. made that were not that were not correct. I just want to make sure that for anyone watching and listening in, you have to look at it from from both perspectives, not not yep. to let one rule the other, but to make sure that both are being accounted for. Because I have been mm -hmm. in a situation where I've done one or the other, and it has not ended well. <laughs> yeah, no, I absolutely agree. You, you have to have both. And you talked about your mental model of how the world is, where you can capture that in description logic. You can serialize that description logic in Al, just never put data against it. That's your model of what real things are. And you can present that to subject matter expert. But it's... It's down to the, the, the return on investment of something. If you're just doing one standalone application, then really it doesn't matter if you're using you know, an SQL database or an mm -hmm. IDF triple store. If you're doing two or three applications, right, now you want to look at the context of that set of applications and say, how do we elevate the concepts mm -hmm. within the context of that you know, might be just the treasury department or yeah. you know, just customer services or something. Mm -hmm. If you're looking at the broader organization as a whole, you want to create a knowledge graph for the whole organization, for example, mm -hmm. well, then you've got a bigger... So, so it's it's kind of like it's the old problem we have with any kind of project that's kind of accounting driven, you know, project based funding versus R and D because, mm -hmm. you know, the real benefit to having any common semantics is longer term. It's being able to have something future proof because, yep. you know, well, classic, I, I don't like the word future proof. Nothing is future proof, but right. it gives you a lot more flexibility, and you're not painting yourself into a corner. I think, which is what uh -huh. I've seen a lot of people do in the knowledge graph space. Yep. Um, that people start with, and I, I recommend you start with a small use case to test it out, see if it's going to work the way you want it to work, see if you have yep. the right skills, yep. you know, all of that. But then you have to take that and make sure that you're not uh, overfitting your model to use a machine learning term. Exactly. Right. Exactly. You don't want to overfit your model for that specific use case because yeah. then yeah. it's going to be so hard for you to be able to use that fabulous knowledge, that knowledge graph that you just created. Nobody else can benefit from it. Exactly. Right? Exactly. That's and, not you know, yeah, it, it used to be you know, in the early days of semantic web, we would say, well, you know, in, in classic data modeling, you can build these rigid models and you get stuck in a corner um, without, you know, you, you, you can everything's additive. You know, we could always come along and interpose new generalizations and so on. And so we've got this flexibility. But like you, I've seen people build themselves into a corner yeah. using Al. I'll give you a simple example just to pick up. Um, you, you know, you, you talked about the example of if something is a pet and it meows and you know, yeah. um, laws and so on, then you can define that that's a cat without having to use the word cat. Um, but if you want to have a bigger set of uses for that ontology, you want to separate out what is a pet from what is an animal. Mm -hmm. You know, there's this wonderful cartoon from David Cypress, the New York cartoonist, this dog looking at this sign in a shop that says, you know, no dogs allowed, uh, uh, is it, yeah, no, no, no pets allowed. Mm -hmm. He walks up to the shop and he says, well, what if I'm just a dog and not somebody's pet per yeah. se. Yeah. And I come in then, you know. Yeah. So um so so yeah, when you're doing one thing on its own, it doesn't matter. Yeah. Like all these pizza and wine and so on ontology yeah. can all sit yeah. nicely on the nose. But if you want to talk about, you know, wine's a great example. In wine making there are words for all of the context specific things that the a, a, a year is 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 um a vintage and ground mm -hmm. is a terroir and a, a grape is a varietal and so on. 
So I happen to have words for all these contextually mm -hmm. relative things. A lot of areas don't, you know. So yeah. you know, there's there's cat and there's cat as a pet. There's dog, and then you can have well, like it's a, also the um dog. the exceptions, right? Like when you're doing the characteristics yeah. of a whole, there's always the exception. So if you're saying, yeah. you know, birds have wings and they can fly. But what about a penguin or an ostrich? Yeah. They don't fly. They they're birds. Yeah. They have wings, yeah. right? Yeah. So um, you you do have to be careful with how. And but that's how that's why modeling is so critical to a lot of this and making those decisions yeah. because again, making sure you're not painting yourself into the corner, but also making sure that you are serving up the the level of granularity you need to be in, understanding yeah. when you are defining things, how are you going to um, be able to handle the exceptions because there's always an exception. Yeah. There's usually more right. exceptions than the rule. Right. 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 Some of the things people say are exceptions are just a, a failure to abstract things in the right way into the right top level ontology. So people get caught up trying to, I'll give you a, a non-industrial example, but you say, okay, here's what a chair is. Okay, fine. But what about a ski lift? Or what about that rock over there? You know, if I can sit on them, are they a chair? And you go, well, again, sometimes there's a word that helps like with the winemaking and sometimes there isn't. Um, because there's a seat, which is anything I can sit on, and there's a chair that's like made to be sat on. Mm -hmm. And for the individual use case, like with the cat, it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. But as soon as I want to reuse that across more spaces, just separating out what is contextually relative, which is actually quite a lot of things, mm -hmm. from what is an intrinsic property. And that's where techniques like OntoClean come in, where you can interrogate your, having taken your original naive ontology, there's always different <laughs> or narrower things like Nairobi is narrower than Kenya and so on. And you brought, got it down to just generalizations as your taxonomic backbone. Now you can interrogate that and say, okay, which of those are rigid types? What is a thing in itself where each of its properties never change in whatever context yeah. I'm using them, which is surprisingly few? Um, and which of them are contextually defined, mm -hmm. you know, the, the, the winemaking and the being a pet versus a working dog yeah. and so on? And you get that right early on, even when you've just got two or three ontologies, you're starting to tessellate your space of where mm -hmm. your ontology is going to be such that you know because you've used the upper ontology mm -hmm. right, you know that each time you add another ontology, you're not going to have to go back and tear the other one apart and separate out the independent from the relative because you forgot to do it before. So, you, Mike, you know, one, you know. one question I have in all of this, though, mm -hmm. is these, these kinds of use cases are very specific to those that are creating and defining upper level ontologies, which is a very small amount of people. Right. It's, it's usually a lot more people are trying to use those things that you're, you're already creating. Right. right, right. So. For for the the average person that's, that's trying to use some of these things, they might not care about that that contextualization that you've made right at, yeah. in the upper right. ontology. Yeah. So the part the problem that I always see and that I hear the most from people is again it's so often everything comes back to semantics in some way. So when we call something a standard, right? It, it implies certain things. And so it's really, if I had to like look at the definitions, it's more of a recommended practice, right? We're saying when you use seat or chair, here's the recommendation of how to contextualize this, how to be uh, more flexible in how you're defining it so that it's it's useful for multiple use cases, depending on what you're doing. That's, that's all very, very helpful. And I think that helps a lot of people that don't want to worry about that stuff, right? Like that's why they use these quote unquote standards so that they don't have to do all the mental gymnastics and they can see what, what you know, all of the people like yourself that are, are coming up with these, these, these um, like really focusing and thinking about these things. They don't, you're taking the, that mental uh, strain off of, <laughs> off of the rest of those that are trying to use it. But this is where I'm going with it. I think it's, I think the problem is often one, we are calling it a standard and it's really not. And two, I think it also is difficult for those getting into graph if they're like, great, I do finance. I'm going to go look at FIBO. And then they look at it and they're like, how am I supposed to use this thing? It's so mm -hmm. abstracted away from my real everyday use case that I don't know how to connect them together. So what, what's, yeah. just, what's some of your advice well, to help with that? Yeah. Well, well, I think, I mean, that's exactly right. I think that the the people solving problems on the ground shouldn't have to worry about these upper ontology partitioning questions. We've dealt with that so that they don't have to, mm -hmm. because actually the people who are really good at creating these applications are not necessarily the same people who are good at thinking about abstractions. Mm -hmm. They might be or they might not be, you know, mm -hmm. the same way that you know, they might be able to play the trombone or they might not. It's a whole <laughs> different skill set, yeah. which some people have and some people don't. Mm -hmm. And so you're, you're right. The aim is that, you know, by dealing with these these partitioning questions up front, it takes the problem away from people on the ground having to think about it. But what we're lacking to some extent is, I think, the tooling. Uh, and the standards. Yeah, there is a standard for top-level ontology. Um, it's an ISO standard, and mm -hmm. 
first part de defines a particular top level ontology which is very constrained into a specific way of looking at the world which may or may not be useful in finance or mm -hmm. you know, other mm -hmm. you know, healthcare and so on um so we're lacking some of the other standardizations of things like these you know contextually relevant things and um you know occurrence and other mm -hmm. partitioning questions um but uh firstly let me answer why you should care if with the relative things it actually cuts right down to data <laughs> excuse me a lot of people a lot of firms that have issues with you know entity data management because mm -hmm. each vertical product they have has a bunch of data about the product the product id product name mm -hmm. and then a bunch of information about you know the client you know their name and address and so on and then the next product has the same stuff in a different order with different field structures mm -hmm. and separating out the what is relative to the context of that product versus what is about that product as a whole the context itself it has properties too versus what is the independent you know that rigid type that is a person or a organization or a legal mm -hmm. uh, person and so on so so yeah those partition problems cut right down through to data um when they're done right but what we're lacking is the tooling that helps people you know ask people the question you know when you just introduced the concept of cat are you talking about a pet or an animal you know it's like um you know here, here where i live With in wales farming machinery exactly. yeah <laughs> well that's true yeah good good question good point i was just coming to a different kind of farming machinery uh here in rural wales if somebody's dog dies, the first thing you ask them is whether it was a pet or a working dog, because mm -hmm. they have a very different mm -hmm. relationship between mm -hmm. a pet and a working dog. And you, know, you don't ever confuse one with the other. So yeah. that's the kind of ontology in people's minds in rural areas about what is or isn't a pet. Um, and you know, so, so we have to have some kind of interface that when people are introducing concepts or extending concepts to an existing ontology like FIBO, that we're asking the question, do you really mean this thing in itself? Do you mean this mm -hmm. thing? In the context of lending or whatever you know even simple terms like you know active account we, we looked at this at a bank last year what does active account mean mm -hmm. and it turns okay. out there are seven or eight different meanings across the bank <laughs> of well. course and everybody assumed that they meant the same thing and they didn't mm -hmm. so that's a terminological problem but then some of those meanings were very contextual and mm -hmm. some were not you know another perhaps more example obvious example is you create people create code lists of address address type yeah, so you've got, oh, a residential address, delivery address, a mm -hmm. headquarters address. And then you start seeing things like temporary address and holiday address. And, mm -hmm. and some of these to overlap. That's not a type. Exactly. Right. It's not to yeah. overlap. And then you realize, well, actually, in that one code list of maybe 20 address types, there are actually three contextual things. There's who can I deliver this thing to? There's who can I legally serve papers on? Mm -hmm. There's, you know, where is this entity physically located? If it's mm -hmm. a human in particular, maybe in one place at a time. Um, a lot more things are contextual than people would think and a lot yeah. of people who don't like this contextual idea go oh this is too much hard work oh, well, well almost everything's contextual and that yeah. you have to get to the point where there's the context of the bank as a whole or the you know medical facility as a whole or the industry yeah. as a whole whatever where some things are always the same within that broad context that's your rigid and, type you know so. I've, I've lived through a few um exercises like that where i i always laugh like there was one a good example in one of my past you know, jobs where we were trying to identify the different types of publications that any type of publisher would have. Good. And there was like this list of over a hundred types. I'm like, <laughs> really? You think there's that many? And like, so what we did is we had the actual encoders who had written up all of these rules mm -hmm. um, about the different types. And we tried to get them to discuss the difference between the ones that were on the list and they couldn't do it. And it's right. because in the moment, or maybe for a very specific use case, maybe there's a new publication type that comes in and you know it's getting a lot of press or a lot of citations or what have you. And so you're gonna add it in. But that doesn't mean it's conceptually different than something that already exists in the list. And I think yes. that yes. that that real world, okay, we gotta get it out, we gotta get it out. It's 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 a really important thing. We can't take that time to really think through it. Or if yeah. you do have the people that can really think through it. They have a million other things to do because this is a really right. unique skill set. Yeah. Well, I think there's two problems there because w one is, you know, in your ideal scenario, somebody can have that conversation with themselves and say, right, I know there's something we need to think about, but we don't have time now. Well, that's fine. That happens all the time. You just, mm -hmm. you know, you have to capture it. You put a little pin somewhere. You say, I'm going to come back and do that then. The more common problem is people not knowing that there's something they don't know. Sure. So, you know, I looked at these these code lists in this, this bank I was working with and I picked apart this example with their... Um, and it was one of about a thousand code lists, you know, mm. and I said, what principles did you use to classify this? And they didn't understand the question. They didn't know that there was such a thing as classification theory. 
They didn't know that they were doing something they didn't know how to do. And so they didn't have a, a pin to come back to to say, right, now the rush is over. We can figure out what this is because yeah. they don't know. They don't know. Um, your example with the a thousand or a hundred odd uh, things, yeah. you see a lot of finance in data feeds where you look at a data feed and it has maybe, you know, there's long code, control code list of, you know, this, this and this. But you unpack it, it's usually four or five different <laughs> concepts, yeah. different combinations. It's yep. just a, kind of a, a square root sort of yeah. explosion. Yeah. So sometimes you just go back and say, okay, well, what were the kind? And of course, what you find is, particularly in the pre-semantic web uh, world, you know, with normal data management and stuff, you'll find that somebody called a data dictionary, and they've somebody written a definition in the heat of that moment, and then somebody else will come along and said, well, except when it's a swap, in which case it means this other thing. <laughs> uh, then somebody else come in and written some logic or you know yeah. some, some code that says, well, if this, then that, and the definition gets longer and longer. Yeah, that's different. And actually, the the key to this whole thing. Is context again, but in a different way. We talked earlier about how words map to different concepts in different contexts, and there's a whole science of that. That's pragmatics, but we, again, we don't have to use the yeah. funny words. For it. It's just context. The same thing is happening with data because data is just like words. It's a symbol that has some relationship to reality. Mm -hmm. So every time somebody's bringing in some new kind of data, what is the context in which they were doing that? Mm -hmm. What is the context? So, so then when somebody says, "Oh, we're going to add a new publication type or something." I say, okay, here's this new uh, type of publication or a new channel by which we're going to publish or distribute things. At the time they're doing that, but there isn't time to do something else. In the organization where they do know that they don't know these things, capture the context. The context mm -hmm. says who, what, when, why. Because, mm -hmm. by the way, later on, when you take those who, what, when, why, hows, all the Ws, those are really just ontological concepts again. Yeah. So the context is nothing more than a place, a process, a person, a combination of sometimes yeah. only just one thing, one time or one place or one role. Mm -hmm. More often, it's a whole combination. So if you can capture in your real world ontology, again, this isn't the data ontology usage. This is ontology. Yeah. ontology. The context in which somebody introduced this new concept, then we know, OK, we can define this as a contextually specific thing right away. Mm -hmm. But it's concept, context in the ontology as well with its relationship to that context. And later on, we can say, OK, well, some of these things might be true in other contexts as well. Exactly. Like I, I kind of care about. Yeah. And I kind of just describe that as packet switching a little bit like, yeah. okay, well, the packet, you know, in, in typical, if people don't know, this is how stuff gets to you through the web, you know, it comes in and then there's a decision that gets split up. And depending on how the context is at the other end is how it gets all bits together when, when you get it. Yeah. So yeah, if was... something is coming in defined as, as a cat and it's coming in and being used in the ontology for a pet store, a pet store so it's probably a pet even if that's not defined yep, in yep. in the actual note itself whereas exactly. if it's coming into you know animal control those yep. could be pets they could just be strays you, you just don't exactly. know so, absolutely um i saw some good examples with that if you look at the um in, in retail the good relations ontology is a mm -hmm. great way of defining something as a product and somebody did a study where they wanted to take something about say climbing products like carabiners and rope and mm -hmm. so on and then look at you know how long you've had this carabiner what what loadings have been put on it or how old is it and so on but all those are facts about that individual carabiner that individual. from the shop but everything in the ontology up to now was about the generic class of the product with a price and a volume and you know maybe three colors it comes in that was relative to and that's what happens is that ontology is all relative to the context of retail so now you mm -hmm. want to use it outside that you know this this fact about the pet shops everything about the pet shop is in the context of pet shop. It's so obviously in that context and nobody has to ever mention it. Mm -hmm. But as you say, when in a different context like animal control, now you want to know which of the things that you learned from your pet shop ontology mm -hmm. are independently true about cats. What do they eat? What do they mm -hmm. run away from? What can you use to catch them? Versus what is true of them as, as pets, like you know chipping and so on. Mm -hmm. So by getting that ontology, by understanding the context of that first ontology, it gives the ability to reuse it and reuse the data mm -hmm. you've collected about individual things that happen to be cats and dogs and so on mm -hmm. that you can then use in the broader or just other contexts mm -hmm. so data reuse again it, 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 by applying those upper ontology concepts mm -hmm. hopefully invisibly so the individual people doing local stuff don't have to care about it because they never will and they never should 